So if somebody's got a question, well, we'll fire away on that. Yeah, Luke. So, uh, the passage you read this morning found it interesting. So many times it seems like he remembered his covenant for his sake, for his name's sake. In this case, it's their sake, so yeah. just thought it was kind of neat. Yep. Yeah, once in a while we, we get thrown in there too, yep. Generally it's for his name's sake. Yeah, that's a great point. Yep. Other questions today? Ken, you got one stored up? I always got tons of questions, but nothing no, Nothing formulated, huh? Right. Charlie, you got one? You. Right, What's that? <laughs> Oh, okay. <laughs> Jason, you got one? No? Joe, how about you? <clears throat> Jim, you got one? No, no? Okay. <clears throat> Daniel, you got to go back. No? No questions? <laughs> Just answers. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> Luke? I don't know if there's a short... Uh, What's, is there an efficient means to answer, you know, people's, one of the, the great challenges that people seem to have is, you know, with, um, in thinking about God and acknowledging him is that, you know, then there's this evil in the world. You know, how could a all-powerful God, you know, allow, allow evil? What's, what's your, what's your short take on that? Yeah. I mean, that, that's a question. Sometimes that's a, just a hostile question, you know. And, but sometimes it's an honest, <clears throat> it's an honest question, you know, is if, if, if God's so good, you know, why is there so much evil in the world? You know, a legitimate question under those circumstances. And <clears throat> it goes back to the fact that God is love and uh, that God wants us to be able to love. Okay, well, love is only possible through free will. Okay, if people are robots, then love's not possible. Love is only a function of free will, and it may take a little bit of work to establish that for some people. But you know, you ask for the quick answer. Now, as soon as God gave angels and men free will, even God has to accept the consequences of that. And so, that's you know that's why things are roll the way they do. Uh, you don't get to blame God for bad things. See, you know, God gives people the choice to be good. Um, Satan puts the temptation in front of them to be evil. People are actually choosing. Uh, now, when Adam and Eve sinned, they were, of course, separated from the tree of life, or separated from uh, God because of their sin, because of their sin, then they are separated from the tree of life. God booted them out of the Garden of Eden, and the law of death and decay entered into the universe. And so, ultimately, even physical death, it can come to babies or anybody else, is a result of the uh, sin, you know, man's choice. The, um, if you turn to John 11 and again, see, it's pretty subtle. But this is where Jesus is approaching the tomb of, of Lazarus. And uh, John eleven thirty three says, When the, Jesus therefore saw her, that's uh, Mary weeping, and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and was troubled and said, Where have you laid him? And they said to him, Come and see. And in verse 38, coming to the tomb, Jesus again, being deeply moved within, came to the tomb. When it says deeply moved within there, that's kind of an interesting word. Part of it was he's angry. Jesus is actually angry here. You know, I mean, the best they can bring it into the New American Standard English is he's deeply moved within. But he's actually a result of anger. In other words, what he's angry at is that death even had to take place in the first place. See, and, and that makes sense that, you know, he's, but it did. So, uh, so don't blame God for the things that the devil puts in motion. God gave the devil free will. You know, he was, 
you know, he was beautiful and, and uh, he was righteous until iniquity was found within him. And uh, from that point on, it, you know, he went downhill, pulled a lot of angels with him by their own free will, and then worked on man, and, and man by his own free will has chosen evil. And so what we've got is we've got a collective corruption then that's occurring in the human race, but you can't blame that on God. When God gave man free will, then even God has to accept the consequences of that. Further thoughts on that? Okay. Uh, Jason. Okay, so Luke inspired me to ask your perspective, and, and you gave me enough time to okay. think of one, so we'll, we'll see how this works. So um, something I know about uh, about you is that you've got a real great ability to <coughs> uh, to meet an individual where they're at and to kind of quickly read that and then in a study kind of format or even obviously when you're meeting someone you've got a real ability to gauge that and to and then to answer the uh, the need of the moment there which is great so i want to try to tap into maybe your ability to do that in this question and the question is when you're when you're meeting a whole variety of people out there coming from a huge amount of backgrounds i mean you've talked about your uh, the lady who um, who uh, worked for uh, I might be getting this wrong, but uh, as a as a counselor for the prison system or something like that, you know, uh, they're going to come from one perspective, and and your um, anyway, your 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 uh, your factory worker, your uh, your mine worker is going to come from a different perspective. Um, so you know, how do you? I guess the phrase that comes to my mind is that you're you're able to respect what's right in the sight of all men. Um, but that doesn't look the same in every case. So I was hoping maybe you could go into that a little bit. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 9 comes to mind. This is the Apostle Paul, you know, to the church at Corinth. The overall discussion has to do with the fact that are, is it okay for Christians to eat meat, <coughs> bought, you know, sacrificed to idols in the marketplace. And as he gets deeper into the discussion, he gets into the idea of why he does what he does. In other words, <coughs> Paul, you know, would be willing to not eat meat if, if that was going to be a problem. Um, and so in verse 19, 1 Corinthians 9, 19, he said, uh, For though I am free from all men... I've made myself a slave to all, so that I may win more. To the Jews I became as a Jew, so that I might win Jews. To those who are under the law, as under the law, though not being myself under the law, that I might win those who are under law. To those who are without law, as without law, though not being without the law of Christ, or law, or law of God, but under the law of Christ, so I may win those who are without law. To the weak I became weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all men, that I may by all means save some. And I do all things for the sake of the gospel, so I may become a fellow partaker of it. What you can see in Paul's life is you see an intense desire to seek and save the lost. And when that desire is real, like in Paul's case, then he's looking at things from the perspective, okay, this is the problem or this is the barrier that I have to get through. And because I care so much for these people, you know, I'm, I'm going to go through those barriers. So, you know, to those who are under the law, to the, to the Jews, then he practices the Jewish system. So he can relate to the Jews. When he's out there working in the Gentiles, he isn't going to be imposing Jewish law on the Gentiles. He, as he puts it, I become all things to all men. See, and here's your driving motivation, that I may by all means save some. And so when we are trying to apply this to ourselves, you know, then the first thing we look at is, is our motivation. See, how strong is my motivation to help somebody else? Um, you know, studies have shown that, okay, when you first meet people, um, a lot of times you don't remember their names. I mean, that's our natural tendency. 
and the reason is that we're primarily concerned about the impression we're making on them. <laughs> and, you know, it kind of backfires on us because, you know, I mean, how many of you had that happen, you know? Like, and uh, see, so it's a, it's a great illustration, but if we're particularly conscious <coughs> of other people, then we'll remember their names. See, if we're not particularly concerned about well, how we're impacted, if we're total focus is on them, then we'll remember their names. And uh, it's just a simple illustration here of the overall principle of, okay, this is, this is an area where we've got to work on. You know, I took a time management seminar from Franklin Covey, I don't know, you know, I hate to think how many years ago, just the other day. And uh, the, uh, you know, so walked in and, you know, I mean, shook hands with the guy, you know, he was just made, made sure that he shook hands with everybody, you know, on the way in and said, hey, you know, you know, my name is, and, and uh, I don't remember his name, and, uh, and uh, you know, and, you know, what brings you to this seminar, you know, where you work and stuff, and okay, and uh, good, you know, just kind of professional type things, okay. Well, some point during the seminar, there were about 60 people there, he went through and called every person by name and said where they worked. Now, how could he do that? See, because, of course, it was a professional thing for him at that point. But see, he's very consciously focused in on the individuals that are at that seminar. Okay? And it's a good illustration, see? So the key for all of us in is you know to and to be able to relate to them to be able to contact is to be so focused on them see that's a simple thing but that's what really opens things up is being able to meet people where they are is uh, our our intense concern when every fiber of our being see shouts i'm here to help you see and that's going to be communicated you know, in our ability to listen and pay attention. Um, so <clears throat> that would be the, the short answer to that, Mr. Shanahan, is, okay, just for all of us to increase our, our focus on the other person and really listen to what they have to say. Um, takes more work to listen. Um, but until you listen, you're shooting in the dark. You don't know, you don't know really where the person's at. But if you can do a little bit of listening, it helps you to hone, you know. And again, if you go to John chapter 3, see in John chapter 3, in verse 1, See, though there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. Okay, you know, you know he's a Pharisee. He's on the Jewish high council. Uh, so, you know, obviously skilled in the law and, and skilled in the customs. You know, knowledgeable of the Old Testament. Um, a guy who'd been uh, to the Passover, okay, and in verse uh, John 2.23, says, Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover during the feast, many believing, believed in his name, observing his signs, what he is doing. So Jesus did a lot of miracles there at that first Passover he attended following his immersion. So back to chapter 3, verse 2. Now this man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you have come from God as a teacher. See, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God's with him. Okay. Now, the uh, guy comes to Jesus at night, not in the daytime. Okay. The, uh, I mean, he's, he's obviously aware that the enemy element is already picking up something on who Jesus is. So he doesn't want to doesn't want to meet him in the daytime. He comes at night, okay? And he says, you know, we know that we know. He doesn't, 
He isn't asking a question here. He's making a statement. We know that you've come from God. Nobody can do the signs you do unless God's with him. Now, Jesus goes over the top of that to the real question that Nicodemus has. You know, what, what are you doing? You know, what are you, what are you bringing? See, and that's why Jesus comes back with an answer on the surface that doesn't make sense. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one's born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. What's Nicodemus interested in? Kingdom of God, okay? He's, you know, back in John chapter 1, it's John the Immerser, in verse 19, John 1, 19, he said, this is the witness or the testimony of John when the Jews, remember Jew in the Gospel of John means the hierarchy, sent to him priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? See, now John the Immerser's work was creating quite a stir. So much so that the big boys in Jerusalem send the smaller boys to go down and ask them, John the question, who are you? What's John's message? Well, repent for the kingdom of heaven's at hand. Get yourself ready for the kingdom. Get yourself prepared. See, so this is creating quite a stir, okay? Then Jesus shows up on the scene performing miracles. Remember, John the Immerser did no miracles. Here's Jesus showing up doing miracles, right? And uh, so, <clears throat> what's, what's on Nicodemus' mind? The kingdom of God. So Jesus says, uh, you can't see the kingdom of God unless you're born again. Okay. See, Jesus is paying attention to where Nicodemus is at, and he's able to answer the unasked question. Now, that's, that's amazing on Jesus' part that he can do that, but it's worthy of our processing and our desire to imitate that sort of thing. So... <clears throat> That's the that's the quick answer, Jason. You got a follow up comment there? When my kids were little, I used to, you know, give them some instruction. And then I'd end off with, uh, "If you know these things, you're blessed if you do them." <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> but uh, but I notice as as um, as easy as it. As you put it out there and it sounds, it's actually pretty, it takes all, it takes all the effort you've got to, it sounds like it's, it just takes everything you got to try and get to that point. It's, it's tough. Yeah. I think I mentioned, you know, when I was freshman in college, <coughs> the uh, head of the chemical engineering department wrangled something with the, you know, the housing uh, college dorm guys. So they had one four that had quite a few physics majors, chemistry majors, engineering majors. Not 100%, but, you know, like 65 or 70%. Because he was sick and tired of the guys that wanted to study <laughs> having their lives disrupted by the party element. And so he was able to wrangle, you know, sixth floor of Hedges South, uh, having a whole bunch of engineers. Well, I was on that floor. And... Uh, so, you know, the, you know, the pre-med guys, you know, the <coughs> engineers, the chemists, the physics, you know, you have all a lot of the same classes. You know, you got, you know, uh, you know, introductory calculus, you know, you've got your introductory chemistry, you got your introductory, you know, all of those classes are the same. You know, <coughs> maybe different teachers, but same class. So a lot of those gave a common test. And uh, <clears throat> so what happened is the night before the test, I'd have about 15 guys in my dorm room. And I'm answering the qu I'm helping them to understand the questions. And uh, see, and that's a really key point is being able to detect where the beginning point is. Okay. Because you can have two different guys ask the same question, <clears throat> but they're going to have a different beginning point depending on where their understanding is. And I regard that in my case as great training, you know, for what I do now. I mean, I used to tutor math, chemistry, and physics 
at the university, you know, when I was working for McDonald's and doing my part to bring this congregation off the ground. And all that stuff has helped me, you know, it's training actually, you know, to be able to see, okay, on an instantaneous fashion, you know, where the beginning point is. You know, and that's that a lot of times that's our challenge, see, when we're work with people. Okay, where do I begin? What's the beginning point? So it's it, it has to be an intense concern on our part and then try to figure out on their case what is the beginning point to answer their question. But listening sometimes helps you determine where that beginning point is. Um, you, you, you use the word instantaneous, which maybe we can get there eventually, <laughs> some of us. Um, but uh, but listening, it, you, you followed up with that listening piece again, and that's a great um, just clarification on. Okay, if we don't have it instantaneously, that's okay. Yeah. Okay, we just need to listen more, yeah. and if we still don't have it, that's okay. Yes. We just need to listen more, <laughs> and then you know. It's truth seekers. They'll keep asking the question until they get it. Yep. See that? And that, remember, that's we got to keep our focus on. That's what we're looking for. Is we're looking for truth seekers. You know, God's desire is that all men be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. See, and you don't want to forget the last part of that that statement. See, so we're our 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 goal is truth seekers. You know, we don't need everybody in Bozeman in this building. Um, if we had everybody in Bozeman in this building, it'd be chaos, <laughs> you know, because there's too many diverse <clears throat> perspectives, see, but uh, the truth seekers are going to sort their way through, and so we don't, it's a good point, Jason, you don't have to, the, the quicker we can get to the answer, the better, the quicker that we can get to the beginning point, the better, but, uh, and then having a systematic means, see, of taking people through the definitions and stuff is really, really key to all this, too, so. For the thoughts or comment, Luke. Just as as you and Jason were talking, just made me think. You know, it's it's definitely a skill, or to be developed, but it's impossible to develop that skill without that initial motivation you were talking about, that concern and the and the listening. You know, I've I've even had some friends that have more approached it from a, a sales thing, almost like here's the tricks and. You can go through all the tricks and people, people, there's something inherent, you know, it's kind of that sixth sense or whatever. People know if you care about them. And I think if you, if you care and you listen, like Jason was saying, even if you don't, if you're not there yet to be able to instantaneously figure it out, people know that you, you actually care and they will keep asking those questions even to you <laughs> until they can get the answer if they, if they understand and recognize that that care so I, I think like you said it's something we all want to get better at and it's a skill to be developed but we can't I don't, you, it's impossible to develop that skill without the initial real intense concern and love for the person's soul so. and knowing God you know of course he'd set it up that way wouldn't he yeah See, we, we love why because he first loved us I mean that's where it works that way across the board other questions or thoughts here today Charlie So this, oops, I'm sorry. Um, I've got a question uh, in Mark uh, no, chapter nine, uh, th basically 37 through 41. But uh, uh, John's, uh, whoever receives one child like this in my name receives me, and whoever receives me does not receive me, and uh, who does not receive me, but him who sent me. John said to him, teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to hinder him because he was not following us. But Jesus said, do not hinder him, for there is no one who shall perform a miracle in my name and be able to soon afterwards speak evil of me. For he who is not against us is for us. For whoever gives us a cup of water to drink because of your name, as followers of Christ, truly I say to you, he shall not lose his reward. My question is, is um, was this a remnant that someone that isn't following Jesus directly could perform miracles back then, and how? <laughs> yeah, that's a great question. Um, I'm going to start in, in uh, Luke chapter 7 on this one.
Luke chapter 7, um, verse uh, 29 and 30. says, uh, when all the people and the tax collectors heard this, you know, that he who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than John the Immerser, they acknowledged God's justice, having been immersed with the immersion of John. But the Pharisees and the lawyers rejected God's purpose for themselves, not having been immersed by John. <clears throat> okay. Now, do you think that John the Immerser could immerse that many people? Good. Um, you know, in uh, John chapter uh, 3... John chapter 3, verse 22. It says, After these things, Jesus and his disciples came into the land of Judea. There he was spending time with them and immersing. John also was immersing in Anon near Salim because there was much water there, and the people were coming to be immersed, for John had not yet been thrown into prison. Therefore there arose a discussion on the part of John's disciples with the Jew about purification. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who is with you beyond the Jordan, to whom you have testified, behold, he is immersing, and all are coming to him. Now, okay, John chapter 4 has a clarification point in here. Therefore, when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and immersing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself was not immersing, but his disciples were, he left Judea and went away again into Galilee. Okay. So, what you see here is John's immersion is something that John started. You know, Jesus carried it on, but you can see there's going to be a lot of people out there preaching the immersion of repentance for forgiveness of sins. The message of repent and be immersed for the forgiveness of your sins is, is going out there. John's not doing all of it. Jesus is not doing all of it. There's a lot of things going on, not specifically recorded in the Scripture. Okay? Now, Let's, uh, let's go to Luke chapter uh, 19. So in verse uh, 29, Luke 19, 29, when he approached Bethphage and Bethany near the mount uh, called Olivet, he sent two of the disciples saying, Go into the village ahead of you, there as you enter, you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever yet sat. Untie it and bring it here. <clears throat> if anyone asks you, why are you untie it, tying it, you shall say, the Lord has need of it. Okay? So those who were sent went away and found it just as he had sent it. And as they were untying the colt, its owner said to them, why are you untying the colt? And they said, the Lord has need of it. Now here's something that Jesus set up apart from the knowledge of the apostles, okay? Now, you guys, a couple of you guys, you go there, and, uh, you know, there will be that colt there and the donkey, and uh, you, uh, you get a hold of it, and uh, if somebody asks you why you're doing it, here's your password, okay? Password's a good word for today. <clears throat> the password is the Lord has need of it, okay? And they'll let you go. See, Jesus had <coughs> that all set up uh, without the apostles' knowledge, Okay, and he does uh, things like that. Uh, the uh, um, when he's getting ready to have the uh, the Lord's Supper, you know, he tells Peter and and uh, and John. He said, "Now you guys go out there and stand on the street for a little bit. And after a while, a guy will come by. He's got a jar of water on his head. You know, all those other places. Who carries the water? Ain't the man. Okay, <laughs> it's the women." I remember, you know, being down at a place called Yeji when I first went to Ghana in 1995. And um, Yeji's on the edge of uh, Lake Volta. And so the village was about, oh, between a quarter and a half a mile back away from the lake. So we camped alongside the lake on the beach. Well, next morning, here come these girls. They're about, you know, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 years old, okay? And they just actually walk right down into the lake. And they got this big, uh, you know, I mean, probably about three gallons worth of, 
you know, water, you know, or ready for it. And they walk down deep enough, they can take a smaller dish and they just scoop it <laughs> and fill that bigger one. And then, you know, here are these little girls, you know, with about three gallons of water <laughs> on their head, you know, you know, and I didn't see a single boy. <laughs> okay. So Jesus said, there's going to be a guy with a jar of water on his head. Okay. You follow him. He'll come to a certain house and he'll stop. Now you go into the house and there'll be somebody waiting there and here's your password. Where are we to have the, the uh, where is it to observe the Passover? Okay. Now Jesus had all that set up without the apostles' knowledge. All of it. Okay. So now to Mark chapter 9. So, the, uh, you know, as you mentioned, verses 38 and 39, you know, James and John, sons of thunder, okay, you know, it's uh, it, well, interesting to watch the sons of thunder apostles, or transition to apostles of love, okay, um, they said, hey, this guy's out there, he's doing miracles in your name, we don't know anything about it, right? Just because they didn't know anything about it, did that mean that Jesus didn't know anything about it? See, he got a lot of stuff. You know, you can tell Jesus got a tremendous information and organizational network, a lot bigger than the apostles know about. And so part of it, this guy's out there, that's part of Jesus' process of getting, you know, things going out there as far as, you know, John's immersion was huge in that. And then you got guys like this that's out there doing miracles in, in Jesus' name. Just because he wasn't with the apostles didn't mean that Jesus didn't know about it. And, uh, you know, they wanted to stop him. Jesus said, man, <laughs> you can't, can't do a miracle in my name <laughs> and speak evil of me. See, so that's, that's kind of what's going on there, Charlie. It's a, there's a big picture there we just get glimmers of we're going through. This is one small example there. So did he have the spirit coming over other people as, as well as the yeah. apostles when, I mean, he made, the, well, of course, this is from their perspective. They all received the Holy Spirit to go out and, yeah. and perform miracles and stuff. But uh, so nothing else was mentioned, but other people did also. Yeah. Well, one good example would be Luke chapter 10. It, that's a little bit more direct, but it's recorded here. Luke chapter 10 and uh, verse 1. And after this, the Lord appointed 70 others and sent them in pairs ahead of him to every city and place where he was going to come. See, he's got this an advanced deal out there. Okay, now when you get to verse 17, you get a little bit more information. It says, The 70 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. See, so he's got... You know, he's got quite an advance. Uh, <clears throat> and, of course, he says in verse 18, I was watching Satan fall from heaven like lightning. That's actually a prophetic statement on Jesus' part. He, he sees that that's going to happen. And he said, Behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions over all the power of the enemy, and nothing will injure you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that spirits are subject to you, but re not rejoice that your names are recorded in heaven. You know, let's keep, let's keep the priorities in place there but so jesus had you know i mean john's immersions going out there a lot of people doing that you got at least 70 others plus this other guy so jesus has got a lot of things going his basic job if we want to put it in those terms is to create the momentum necessary for the church to come off the ground on the day of pentecost now that's quite a job if you think about it, see, so that's why the miracles and everything else are going, see, and the message, the kingdom of heaven's at hand, see, I mean, <clears throat> I mean, the Jews are all misunderstanding, including the apostles, you know, they're, they're still right at the last minute, they're fighting over who's going to sit at the right hand and who's going to sit at the left hand, right, in the kingdom, so, <clears throat> but, see, it's, it's serving the purpose of getting, getting the people ready, 
So Jesus had a lot of things like that going on on a major scale because when Acts 2 hits, the church, if the church doesn't come off the ground in Acts chapter 2, guess what? It's not coming off the ground. So from a human perspective, you know, planning and organization, things like that, that's part of what's going on. Further comment there, Charlie? Yeah. See, again, it's, it's in the scripture, but you don't pick that up your first reading, you know what I mean? But see, it's, it's just those little things that are there all the way through letting us know. I mean, you can tell Jesus' responsibility is to make sure that all the Old Testament prophecies are fulfilled. That's one of his responsibilities. And the last one he's got to fulfill is they gave me vinegar to drink. He's got them all done, but one, he's got one more, one more peg that's got to go in the hole, right? <laughs> and uh, so he says, I'm thirsty. He sees a start jar of vinegar standing there. He says, I'm thirsty. So yeah, one of the soldiers ran, put a sponge in it, dipped it, and gave it to him. And gave it, you know, you know. So when that's done, Jesus said, it's finished. We got her done. Uh, other questions here today? Okay. Ken, you got one? You looked like you had a question. I mean, your eyebrows were shaped like question marks, so. <laughs> but not yet. Okay. Jim. I'd like to back up to the uh, original question. Um, and with your ability to um, recognize where a person's at and meet them where they're at because of the training that you've had, that's basically what I'm getting so far, um, and your desire to imitate those who care enough for people's souls to make that emanate from you, right? I mean, that, that's what I'm getting so far. Um, how much in your uh, ongoing, in, in your history, has the Holy Spirit interjected circumstances in your life that, that you're just aware of, you know, and can you comment on some of that? Well, I, you know, I don't know if any of us can definitely say, you know, okay, this is the action of the Holy Spirit, okay? Uh, you know, the, yeah, there's circumstances that happen Obviously, God orchestrates the circumstances, but see, I'd be a little hesitant to say, okay, the Holy Spirit led me here, the Holy Spirit guided me into that, or the Holy Spirit opened this up. See, because I know where that leads to. And uh, so, you know, what I'm particularly interested in is if I get an open door, you know, I want to go through that, and, you know, those open doors open up when you got more and more Bible studies or whatever open it up. So I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't want to say, you know, I was aware the Holy Spirit did this. It kind of goes back to something we were talking about a couple of weeks ago when, when uh, uh, Gary and I were in the Philippines, you know, and there's this lady that had epilepsy and, you know, you know, I'm preaching on the indwelling Holy Spirit to these guys that don't believe in the indwelling Holy Spirit. And, you know, Three times it happened. You know, I'm just about to make my point. Lady starts screaming. Get her stabilized. Preach along. You know, about ready to make my point. Second point, starts screaming. Same thing at the third point. And I'm appreciative of the fact that Gary was there as a witness because, you know, I come back and tell you, oh, this is what happened in the Philippines. You know, <laughs> you know I mean, you know, in that, that village outside of uh, Batak, man, that was way back in there. And, uh, uh, so, you know, I, I, I'm glad to have a witness. Of course, you probably you don't know how much I paid Gary off to, you know, verify my witness. But, uh, you know, I mean, I really did. I mean, it did enter my mind. I really did want to say, in the name of Jesus Christ, <laughs> come out of her. <laughs> I mean, I went through my mind, you know. <clears throat> but it would have been a disaster if I could have done it. It would have been an absolute disaster because... Now, instead of being able to preach, you're going to have 60,000 people standing there that, you know, I mean, you go through the Philippines, you know, I mean, they're bringing their kids, you know, with uh, cleft palates, and I mean, 
mean, the, the amount of money you could pour into humanitarian aid, just overwhelming. I mean, when Gary and I first went to the Philippines in 2002, the population was 80 million. You know, about a year and a half ago, population in the Philippines went over 100 million in an area three quarters the size of the state of Montana, half of which you can't live on. Okay, so you you know you can't even you can't even begin to process this thing. Um, so the you know I wouldn't want to attribute then things to the Holy Spirit from my perspective because that's going to open just like if I could have cast that demon out that day, whew, that would have been a bad thing. You don't think, well, it should have been a good, it would have been a bad thing. Because all of a sudden, you know, you don't get to preach the gospel anymore. And same way, if I start attributing this to the Holy Spirit or that to the Holy Spirit or whatever, okay, do you know where that's going to lead to? So you have to always think, not only what, what is, am I doing right now, but what are the, what are the after effects of that? So I, I, I'm not going to say, well, the Holy Spirit definitely did this or the Holy Spirit definitely did that. I just know that I've tried to walk my life. I've tried to pray for wisdom. If, if a door seems to open, I try to go through it. And uh, I didn't, you know, I'll do my job and let the Holy Spirit do his. And uh, he's pretty capable. And if there's a problem, we know where the problem might be. Well, it won't be with the Holy Spirit. So that's how I'd answer that question, Jim, because I can't, you know, I, I don't want to, I don't want to myself go in the wrong direction, nor do I want other people go in the wrong direction. We just have to pray. We have to make decisions. You know, pray for wisdom, make decisions. Gary's got a comment back here. Just a quick comment on that, that woman there. You know, even if you could um, have, have done that, you see examples in the, in the Bible where, the miracles that Jesus did, that, that identified that who he was. Yeah. But it didn't seem to do any have any effect on person, a person's faith. So if someone today could be doing those things, it'd be a great, great humanitarian thing, but is it going to bring people to Christ? Yeah. Generally, people are after what they're after. Okay, I'm healed. I'm out of here. Thank you. Bye. And it, 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 it makes sense, too, that... Um, it would take away your ability to preach the gospel. That that really made sense when you made that statement. Now everybody wants you to heal them. They're going away from the word of God. They're, they're been, it would have been a huge bad thing for you to be able to perform a sign when you're saying that the signs are gone in the first place. Okay, you're gone. You're you're going against the word of God in the first place. So that's not going to happen. And to be able to base your uh, what we're trying to persuade people with is not with signs and wonders, but with the Word of God. That's the that's the wisdom of God. That's the that's what He decided to do in the first place. That's why we have the Bible, and that's what we're supposed to use it for. Yeah. In uh, Acts chapter seven, there's an interesting statement with regard to Moses. I think is significant here, and I think this is how the Scripture is going to handle these issues of. You know, obviously, we know we end up being at the right place at the right time, all of us. And uh, so that's the orchestration, or sometimes what we call the providence of God. Okay. And uh, this is uh, Moses, in, uh, the re as Stephen recounts it. Okay. In, um, in verse uh, 22, Acts 7, 22, it says, Moses was educated in all the learning of the Egyptians, he was a man of power in words and deeds. But when he was approaching the age of 40, it entered his mind to visit his brother and the sons of Israel. It entered his mind. Okay, now that's all the scripture does with that. Now we know, you know, I mean, we got the overall look at this, that this was the hand of God setting in motion everything that was to come in the future, including, you know, the eventual coming of Christ to the world. See, so, you know, to what extent certain things enter our mind... You know, we just have to leave it there. You know, I mean, I made a decision to get out of bed this morning. I actually did. <laughs> you know, we all did, right? And uh, it's a decision. And 
Now, um, you know, why sometimes we make a decision to go here and make a decision to go there, you know, that might be, you know, it ended our mind. You know, it might be that, you know, the, the Lord, you know, opened somebody's heart to make a contribution to somebody that was in need or some point that need, you know, where extra finances are necessary. But you can't go beyond the scripture. You just have to leave it, it entered his mind. And, uh, you know, and that's ultimately, see, Moses made a decision. You know, it entered his mind, but he didn't have to act on that. But he did, he did act on it. So these, these things are all decision-based, and uh, we need to keep that in play because otherwise you open the future brethren to all kinds of things, claims that the Holy Spirit did this, the Holy Spirit did that. And uh, you can't guarantee that that was the Holy Spirit doing that. You know, see, somebody can make the claim, but they, they can't make the guarantee. Further question or thought here today so far? Well, let me take you to Revelation 20. Now, this is the last couple minutes of class. This is what I was going to do today. <laughs> but I just, more of a commentary on the times. Okay. In, in Revelation chapter 20, verses 5 and 6. <clears throat> talked about the rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were completed. He says this is the first resurrection. And said, Blessed and holy is the one who has a part in the first resurrection. Over these the second death has no power, both they be priests of God and of Christ, will reign with him for a thousand years. <clears throat> Just bringing this up because what this does is establishes that the thousand years is the church age. In other words, the, the people that have a part in what he calls the first resurrection, um, they, uh, they're priests of God, of Christ. Uh, the second death has no power over them, and they reign with him. Okay, so, well, the first of those first resurrections started happening on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. So what that does is that lets you know that the thousand years is a reference to the entire church age, okay, which is key then in figuring out what's going on here. This is actually Revelation 20 verses 5 and 6 are the key verses for the whole book of Revelation. There, that's the initial key to unlock all the rest of it. Okay. But knowing that the thousand years is the church age, you have a picture then in Revelation 20 and verse 7. It says, when the thousand years are completed, Satan will be released from his prison and will come out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together for what he calls the war. And the number of them is like the sand of the seashore. And they came up on the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city, and fire came down from heaven and devoured them. And the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophets are also. And they'll be tormented day and night forever and ever. Okay, so we know how this ends. What we have here, of course, is a picture in the final stage of the church the uh, church being surrounded. We've talked about it before, but you can't point to a certain spot on the globe and say this is the church. The church is a spiritual entity. So it's not a physical surrounding, it's a spiritual surrounding. One of the things I'm trying to be aware of is some of the things connected with the proposed vaccine. Okay, now, you know, I mean, a lot of us are aware, you know, you can go back to the labs at Wuhan and you know, how do you get uh, an animal coronavirus that, you know, switches over to people? It's, it's kind of like that Lyme's, Lyme's disease, you know. I mean, the federal government refused to admit that Lyme disease exists, you know, because there's, it gets the name Lyme because in Lyme, Connecticut, just off the coast, there's a, there's a laboratory where they experiment. What's that? Okay, all right, thank you for that clarification. And, uh, but it gets its name from the city where it started, right? <laughs> okay, how did it get there? A uh, really good question. And uh, see some of these other things that, you know, going on. Well, the vaccine, as near as information that, that, that we have, the vaccine will contain the necessary metals to 
be able to be to track you. And uh, so it's it's uh, it's designed to be a global vaccination for everybody. And with Gil Bill Gates is financing, and you know, coupled with the computer thing, you see that they might have a means of tracking every citizen on the planet. Okay, if they do that, guess what happens to freedom? And I'll try to, to bring a video on that here down the road some place that uh, so somebody, you know, there's a lot of quacks out there that, you know, I mean, you have to try to, you know, but the, the lady who makes this presentation pretty clearly is not a quack. It's, it's like uh, on the election, um, Dr. Shiva from um, Massachusetts, MIT, he and his two, two other guys teamed up to analyze the voting from three cities in Michigan. Or th yeah, three, actually three counties in Michigan. And it's really clear when they show it to you that the election was rigged at some point to start throwing uh, Republican votes over to the Democrat side. And, you know, they got the graphs to prove it. I'll, I'll get some of you that website if you want to look on it. Okay. There's quacks out there, but when you got guys got credentials, you know, dealing facts, and, uh, you know, can back it, okay, that, that makes quite an impact. Same way with the lady that talked about the vaccine, all right? And the vaccine contains the elements <coughs> that will make it possible for every human being on the planet to be traced. Okay, all right? So... The reason I'm bringing that up is there is a possibility that the last stages of Revelation 20 are starting to kick in here. And if that's the case, see, we as Christians need to be particularly conscious of that and really focused on what we need to be doing here in the short amount of time that we have. Okay, in other words, now's the time not to be particularly planning your retirement. You know, and if some of the things that they've been floating with the regard to a major lockdown coming, right? You've seen it. If they, if they do that, you know, what a national lockdown. Okay, what, what's going to happen to the economy? What, okay, we don't know. We honestly don't know. But we have to, on an individual basis, be very, very dedicated and committed to Carrying out the scripture, you know, make sure we get the scripture pumped into our skulls on a regular basis so that we keep our perspective and then keep our focus on what's important because a lot of other things are going to have to be unimportant by comparison.